check, 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 check. Yeah, we're on. I saw recently a picture on Facebook of a pew that sits one person and said it was especially for the introverts in churches when they say, greet your neighbor. I ain't got no neighbor. <laughs> I loved it. Good morning. You guys look fantastic. It is, um, I just want to be uh, um, in the same page as PD. It is so good to see you guys. Seriously, so good. It was a salve for the heart. We love each and every one of them. Yes. Um, today, we're continuing in James chapter 1. Um, would you stand with me while I read the word? Yeah. Do you mind? Okay. James 1, starting at verse 19. Know this, my dear brothers and sisters. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to grow angry. This is because an angry person does not produce God's righteousness. Therefore, with humility, set aside all moral filth, the growth of wickedness, and welcome the word planted deep inside you, the very word that is able to sa save you. You must be doers of the word and not only hearers who mislead themselves. Those who hear but don't do the word are like those who look at their face in a mirror. They look at themselves, walk away, and immediately forget what they were like. But there are those who study the perfect law, the law of freedom, and continue to do it. They don't listen and then forget, but they put into practice in their lives. They will be blessed in whatever they do. If those who claim devotion to God don't control what they say, they mislead themselves. Their devotion is worthless. True devotion, the kind that is pure and faultless before God the Father, is this to care for orphans and widows in their difficulties, and to keep the world from contaminating us. Jesus, I thank you so much that I have this opportunity to bring this word. I thank you that you have used this to teach me so much. And I thank you that you are in this place, and I ask that every word that comes forth from my mouth is exactly what you intend for it to be, and that hearts are open, the ground is fertile, and that those ears hear everything that you have for them today. We give you praise and thanks in your mighty name. Amen. Amen. So a pastor one day was walking down a country lane, and he sees a young boy struggling to load hay back onto a car after it fell off. You look really hot, said the pastor. Why don't you sit down and rest a moment, and I'll give you a hand. No thanks, said the young boy. Ben did this just last week. No thanks, said the young boy. My father wouldn't like it. Don't be silly, said the pastor. Everyone is entitled to a break. Come have a drink of water. And again, the young man said his father would be upset. Losing his temper, the pastor said, your father is a real slave driver. Tell me where he's at and I'll give him a piece of my mind. Well, said the young man, he's under the hay. See, Christians don't get angry, you guys. We just get a little cross. <laughs> I cannot believe you guys were that slow. My sister was the fastest, and usually I have to explain it to her. <laughs> I'm kidding. Before I really dive in, we want to acknowledge the shiny disco ball in the room. In case no one has noticed, Steve was so excited for church that he really went all out. Somebody likened him to the rhinestone Christian. <laughs> Somebody also likened him to Pharaoh in the Technicolor magic thing, like takes off his helmet. Yeah. Uh, actually, what this was was a house full of teenage girls that saw something on TikTok and went, oh, I have a great idea. And he was far too kind to say, no, you don't. <laughs> But I'm thinking this would be a really good youth fundraiser. We just need to find something else to, to, to do what? Right. We'll just do Google eyes next time. <laughs> uh, anger is not hard to find in the world, ever. It's all around us. It's in the news. It's on social media. 
people in stores, people driving. Anger is everywhere. Webster's Dictionary actually defines anger as a strong feeling of displeasure, but being angry with someone and shouting, I have a strong feeling of displeasure towards you, just doesn't quite have the same oomph. <laughs> Science says anger is a byproduct of another emotion. The world says anger is an active and passionate response to of the entire person to a real or a perceived wrong. And all of them have happened to you. All of them. All of them have happened to me. But the biblical definition of anger is a disobedience to the word of God. Anger can either be constructive if handled righteously or destructive if handled sinfully or not addressed. Before any of you start to think anger is wrong, let me remind you that we see throughout the Bible both God and Jesus get angry. When deliberate disobedience or a perversion of the directions God gives happen, he gets mad. I, I do often wonder, though, if believers today would be less prone to disobedience and less prone to pride if God would just smite someone every so often. <laughs> like, just to keep people in check. <laughs> Let's look at Ananias in Acts chapter 2, okay? It wasn't a sin that he kept some of his money. It was a sin that he lied about keeping the money. Like, maybe that's what we need every once in a while is, God, you just go, you're done. Because then we'd be like, I'm not going to, oof. That's, that's a bit much. I'm just saying maybe a smite every so often is not a bad idea. <laughs> Anger is not a sin. But it is an emotion that's warned against many times throughout the Bible. That's because anger is the fastest acting emotion we have. It is the one emotion we have that can and will blind us enough to behave in ways that we rarely ever would. It's an emotion that we can behave irrationally, explosively, dangerously, and it can destroy others and wound the body of Christ when it's left unchecked and uncontrolled. Ephesians 4.26 says, be angry and do not sin. Don't let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. It's very interesting that Paul brings up anger and then he caps it with closing off an invitation to Satan. And we'll get to that part. But as a caveat, this passage does not mean stay up for days on end and solve your dispute. <laughs> Please go to bed when you're upset. It's okay. As a friendly reminder... Sometimes people in the Bible get angry or they get depressed and then God says, take a nap and have a snack. You'll be fine, Susan, calm down. <laughs> but what it's really saying is in times of anger, don't sin. Make sure your anger is righteous in, in nature and you never, ever, ever, ever let that person walk away hurt. You never let unforgiveness settle in a place of anger. Don't let it replace it. There are two kinds of anger, righteous and unrighteous. Righteous anger focuses on God, his kingdom, his rights, his concerns, and it is not focused on me. It is not focused on my kingdom my rights, my feelings, or my concerns. In scripture, God-centered motives drive righteous anger. Righteous anger focuses on how people offend God in his name, not me in my name. It focuses on the disobedience toward God more than the wrong done to me. In other words, Saying something is offensive is not good enough. We have to view it as offending God. This type of anger actually will spur action in the body of Christ. How? Well, I'm angry that sin is glorified in mainstream culture. That makes me mad. I'm angry that it's not just glorified, but it worms its way into the heart of believers and is now justified as lawful and, un and acceptable. 
I'm angry that the laws of the land completely subvert the word of God and make a mockery of God's creation because in Genesis it says he made them to resemble God. He made them male and female and he blessed them and called them humanity on the day they were created. God does not make mistakes. Hear that loud and clear. He does not make mistakes. Call yourself whatever you want, but God made you in his image and he's not confused about your gender or who he is. That makes me mad. It makes me so angry when I hear about those things. How do I deal with it? Do I flip a table? Maybe I'll uh, launch a hate-filled campaign on social media. Maybe I'll speak condemnation to the lost. That'll really get them, right? Maybe I should post all over social media how wrong they are. Maybe I should just walk up to them and tell them they're in sin. No, I don't do any of that. I love them. I love them so completely and so well because Jesus died for them too. I pray for them and I pray for open doors to share the truth with them on a personal level. I vote for biblical truths and I speak the truth that they need Jesus because I'm not going to convince them to change their mind or their heart or even their situation, but God can. I will not convince a single person to come to Christ by beating them over the head with the Bible. It's just not going to happen. I am too busy worrying about my own closet to worry about theirs. But I can use my righteous anger to spur me on to love them deeper and more completely. I don't need to be confrontational because then that can take me into the other kind of anger. And then my emotion is controlling me. Rather, I move in action and I become a doer rather than just a hearer. It doesn't matter what the sin looks like. It's still sin. I'm not any less sinful. So why would I pick on that one thing? The second kind of anger is unrighteous or sinful anger. This one focuses on self. It's inappropriate when we choose to be angry or have a different emotional response because we are personally offended in some way. Commonly, we feel offended or personally attacked and we lash out. Twisting this anger into manipulate, um, twisting this anger to manipulate into righteous anger is very dangerous. And it can be very tempting to do because we want to try and justify our emotions. While we can become offended, it is still a personal choice to pick up offense. I know that that one steps on a lot of toes, and I was like, Lord, are you sure? It's my choice if I get offended. I don't have to. I don't have to take it personal. I choose to. My offense is mine. If I cannot find any biblical evidence for getting offended because Susie didn't compliment my haircut last week, then I have no business getting offended. Full stop. I can make a fuss over my feelings, but then that just shows a lack of maturity in me, and it shows that I'm seeking popularity and attention, not striving to live at peace with others. It can be really destructive in the body. It causes dissension, it causes division, and any attempt to cover it up with scripture is wrong. I learned a long time ago that my attitude, my behavior, and my offenses are mine. If I cover something with scripture, it doesn't make it any less sinful. It's important to see the anger like that is included in a list of disturbing sins. In Galatians 5.19, now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, that's actively opposed or hostile towards, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. 
I warn you as I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's a really long list of some really gnarly stuff, yeah? I mean, I don't practice sorcery on a regular basis. <laughs> that would be weird. Um, I try not to have rivalries. Sometimes people are just oh, jealous of my awesomeness. <laughs> Just in case you were wondering, that was pride right there. <laughs> <laughs> but did you notice that right in the middle, Paul says, fits of anger. Fits of anger can bar me from heaven? Yeah. You see the rest of the sins too? As people, we tend to rank things on a scale and say, well, this is worse and this is better. But every single one of those sins is a sin. There is no scale. We create the scale. A sin is a sin is a sin is a sin is a sin. It all looks the same. But every single one of those sins listed harm. They harm you or they harm someone else. They are things that operate completely in the flesh. And they provide a foothold for the enemy to come who wants to steal, kill, and destroy he will twist every situation to convince you that your rivalry or your fit of anger or your jealousy is God-given. He will label it with things like unity or inclusion. Or worse, he will completely turn your heart, prey on your natural tendencies in your flesh to want relationship with people around you. And if you give him a foothold, he will unleash hell in your heart. And then... It spills over into your relationships and then it spills into the body of Christ. Anger is so dangerous. Scripture is very clear that anger must be removed along with the other flesh-driven sins. Colossians 3, 5, so put to death the parts of your life that belong to the earth. Put to death the things in your life that belong to the earth. Sexual immorality, moral corruption, lust, evil desire, greed, which is part of idolatry. The wrath of God is coming upon disobedient people because of these things. You used to live this way when you were alive to these things, but now, now, set aside these things such as anger, rage, malice, slander, and obscene language. We sometimes forget that last one. Right. Your tongue is sharp. And you let some of those four-letter words fly because you're angry, it's extra sharp. You used to live this way and were alive to these things. That really catches my attention. See, Paul and James are saying the exact same thing. Therefore, with humility, set aside all moral filth and the growth of wickedness and welcome the word planted inside you, the very word able to save you. Because you're not alive to those things anymore. Because in your old flesh, in your old man, that's what you did. You got mad. You cussed. You'd see somebody that was attractive and you would go, ooh. Because you... We're dead. But now you're alive. Just get rid of it. Those flesh driven behaviors, all that junk, that's what makes you filthy and us, not you, us. Filthy and sinful. And it's because that type of anger comes so naturally to us. We are so prone. We are so prone to selfishness, and selfishness is a catalyst for pride. We are so prone to pride, which is a catalyst for offense. And when you get offended, what happens? Do you just let it sit? No, you get mad. You get angry. But when you walk in this flesh, you sin in your anger and you say hurtful things. 
You act irrationally. You hurt others. You hide things. You cover up sin. Blame others. Because it's not your fault that you're offended, right? If they didn't X, Y, Z, then you wouldn't be QRT. You sin in your anger. But the thing is, it's all part of our fallen humanity. Over and over and over and over, the Bible says, pull it out. Set it aside. Get rid of it. It's not because you and I are broken. That's not why we walk through these emotions. Just so you know, that's not why. It's because we are human. If we want, I don't know about any of the other women in here, but when I get to heaven, I have a list for Eve. I'm going to say, sit down, we're talking. <laughs> Look at what you have done to me. <laughs> Number one, childbirth. Explain yourself. <laughs> Number two, pain. Really? Every 30 days, give me a break. <laughs> like, I've got a list, and then I'm going to do the same thing with Adam. You know. Just because the woman is always right does not mean you had to listen that one time. <laughs> it's because we're human, you guys. We are so finite. We're so finite. It takes one thing to set us off. One thing. But the accomplishment comes when we overcome that one thing. And we don't walk in our sin for that. Ephesians 4.31, put aside all bitterness, losing your temper, anger, shouting, and slander, along with every other evil. These are manifestations of anger in our selfish heart, all because we just didn't get what we wanted. Bitterness is a long-lasting resentment which wreaks havoc on our relationships. Manifestations of our unrighteous anger include outbursts of anger while speaking, Facial expressions, yes, even that. <laughs> Proverbs 25, 23 says, a person who plots quietly provokes angry faces. Okay. <laughs> Y'all, this one, this one hit me hard. <laughs> because my mom likes to tell me that I don't need a sleeve to wear my feelings. <laughs> my face carries all my subtitles. Uh... And uh, sometimes my subtitles show even when I'm not thinking they do. I always invite people to question me when my subtitles are showing because sometimes I'm just thinking or I'm just pondering or I'm concentrating. But sometimes my flesh is winning. And sometimes I'm in a mood. And I appreciate my husband holding me accountable for those times because, shoo. Pray for your girl. <laughs> Pray for your boy. Because when it happens, and it does happen, uh, <laughs> it's just not pretty when my flesh wins. <laughs> it's not pretty. My children know how much their mommy loves them. <laughs> but my children have a screamer for a mom. <laughs> when something irritates me, I'm like, ah! And I, I try to make a joke about it and say, the demon that's in here will come out and you will be afraid. But the reality is, if I don't get control of it, it scares my kids. That took a lot of work. Because that's the truth of it. I don't want to be that person. Manifestations of unrighteous anger can even include violence. You can say, well, I'm not a violent person. I'm not hitting people. I'm not walking around kicking somebody because some it doesn't matter. Matthew 21, you have heard it said that though by those who live long ago don't commit murder. Anybody kill somebody in the last 72 hours? Yeah? Sam is, <laughs> Sam has. So we're going to pray for him and then somebody quick call the police. <laughs> All who commit murder will be in danger of judgment. All right, cool. I'm out. But I say to you, everyone who is angry with their brother or sister is in danger of judgment. Come again? 
If you say to your brother or sister, idiot, you're in danger of the fire of hell. And you will be condemned with the same anger you condemned. You want to know who said that? Jesus. Jesus himself groups unrighteous anger with murder. A lot of times people say it's, it's gossip. Gossip is the same thing as murder. Do you not realize that anger is too? If I know that my anger can scare my family when I walk in my flesh, I have killed their spirit of joy that they find in family. If I get angry with someone in the church and I stay angry, I have killed a relationship that God calls us to be in. It's not just the enemy who comes to still kill and destroy. It's when we let the enemy take a foothold. We too will still kill and destroy. Do not let him get a foothold. Jesus is saying that all of it is on the same spectrum of sin because it all comes from the same spirit. Satan, the enemy of your soul, he wants to steal, he wants to kill, and he wants to destroy. Now sometimes we hear that and we, we accept it a bit flippantly like, all right, I went to church on Sunday and prayed for crop failure for all the seeds I sowed this week, so we're good. That's not how that works, you guys. It sometimes doesn't really register with us until we start to see it in action. We start to see the death of a church. Start to see the death of a family. Start to see the death of a relationship. And then we realize, whoa, how do I back this up? How do I fix this? It all stems from the spirit of pride and self. That little ledge of unrighteous anger that entertained that one outburst has suddenly become a gaping hole of fury, hurt, and bitterness. And just like that, the enemy is off, and he runs away with your heart and your mind. There are two things that drive anger, unrighteous anger. Number one, love of self. Further on in the book of James, James describes the love of ourself and our own passions that are at war within us. The world and even our, our own hearts will try and tell us that other people or other circumstances drive our anger. But God tells us that our offense and our anger comes from our own evil desires at war within us. We chose to worship ourselves by chasing after our own desire or our own idol and choosing not to love and worship God. Ouch. Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven 37 says, You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Well, what does that mean? Simply that there is no room for offense from others or anger because your worship of God is so all-consuming that you see nothing but the goodness of God in every single situation, and you only have righteous anger for the things that break God's heart. When he revealed that to me, I just went, whew, I'm a mess. I am a straight-up disaster, Lord. Help me see just you in everything, because I don't. Like, that's the truth of it, I, I don't. I see God in the things where I put him. I don't see God in the situations at work when I'm irritated or at home when I'm overwhelmed or at 6.30 in the morning when I don't want my children in my bed because it's Saturday and I'm trying to sleep in. I don't see God in those situations. 
Well, that's because I have a love of myself at those times. I don't want to be interrupted in my work, leave me alone. I have this list of to-do things in my home, I just have to get them done, and if I don't get them done, I create some deadline with, <laughs> like, anybody else do that? I have to get this done. Somebody coming? No, that's not the point. <laughs> I was just like, man. The second thing that drives unrighteous anger is a lack of trust in God. Fun fact, we were not supposed to sing Trust in God this morning. <laughs> we were supposed to sing something else, and it just was not. It just was not working. Like, it didn't really matter what we tried to do. We, we tried this dynamic. We tried that dynamic. We tried this key. We tried that key. It was not happening. And Lori's like, just pull out Trust in God. We all know that. We're good. <laughs> You're right. God had his way. No lie, love of self in that moment went, we can keep doing it, it's fine, just make it work. But trusting in God in that time would have helped me see through God's heart that he had something different in mind. Maybe Cindy should probably s get out of God's way. So the second thing that drives our unrighteous anger is a lack of trust in God. Anger and resentment begin to build in our hearts when we believe that God is not meeting our expectations. <coughs> that leads to not fully trusting him. And then we end up learning the hard way that trusting in self or others is unreliable at best, and it really makes a huge mess out of something that started small. And then when man fail us, we get mad and say, God, where were you? What happened, Lord? I don't understand. You said you'd help me and you never. And he's like, well, you took the lead, so I'm going to let you do it. You thought you knew better. Anybody else ever heard those words? No? Just me? Cool. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a mess, I'm telling you. James 1.19, everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to grow angry. This is because an angry person does not produce God's righteousness. An angry person does not produce God's righteousness. You know, an angry person doesn't produce a whole lot of anything, except constant conflict. Anger produces bitter fruit, and bitter fruit brings death. Death of a dream death of a promise, death of a relationship, death of a church. Anger is destructive because unrighteous anger is a product of self. So what do we do? Therefore, with humility, set aside all moral filth and the growth of wickedness and welcome the word planted deep inside you, the very word that is able to save you. But God, did you see what they posted? But God, did you hear what they said? God, do you know what they're doing? Oh, look at that. Cindy just slipped right back into unrighteous anger fueled by self. Look, it doesn't matter, y'all. It, d say it with me, it doesn't matter. With humility, with humility, that means let them. Let them post it. Let them say it. Let them do it. My heart will stay humble and thankful and focused on God because I choose to be so consumed with worshiping God that I don't have time for the rest. I cannot let it be about me. I have to let me be about my father's business. Everything I do, let it be for him. Not my gain, not my glory, because I am not building the kingdom of Cindy. 
It really doesn't have a nice ring to it anyways. So let them. It's not easy. Please do not think I am saying that this is easy because it's not. I am a person. I am a very emotional person. I have wants. I have desires. And I get my feelings hurt just like you. But what am I going to do with it? Well, that's why the rest of James is so important. It's almost like God made a book for us to know what to do. You must be doers of the word, not just hearers who mislead themselves. Those who hear but don't do the word are like those who look at their face in a mirror. They look at themselves, walk away, and immediately forget what they were like. But there are those who study the perfect law, the law of freedom, and continue to do it. They do. They don't listen and then forget, but they put into practice in their lives. They will be blessed in whatever they do. Have, um, okay, I'm going to tell you a story. Don't laugh. It's not nice. I have psoriasis. It's a newer diagnosis. I think I found out in, like, November. Is that what I told you? Okay. Um, so I have to put, like, a special ointment on <laughs> like my elbows and my fingers and my toes, my joints specifically, but I also get it on my nose, which is super fun when you wear makeup. Ladies, you know what happens? It flakes every time without fail. Add to that, it's allergy season. <laughs> I'm so excited. I can't stop blowing my nose which makes my already dry nose drier. So <laughs> don't laugh. I put makeup on a couple weeks ago and was like, I've got a huge, like, it is so dry, it's ridiculous. And I went, I wanted to go and get some Vaseline because I don't know what I thought, it would help. I'm sitting at work, <laughs> I'm sitting at work and I'm just, I'm just doing my thing. And a guy comes in my office to ask me a question, and he's, he's looking at me. He's looking at me like, there's something wrong with me? And didn't say anything. I'm like, what is the... I knew in the morning when I put my makeup on that my nose was dry. So I, I knew that there was an issue happening here. And I went away and forgot about it and went to work and was doing my thing. And then one of my coworkers is like, you okay? I'm like, I'm fine. What do you need? Helped him with his issue, went to the bathroom, and I had a huge flake of dry skin hanging from my nose. And I don't mean small, I mean huge. I died a little bit. And then I was like, why didn't you say something? He goes, well, I thought it was a booger. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was dry skin <laughs> but I looked in the mirror and saw it and I went to work and totally forgot that I got dry skin so don't do that but practically what does that mean don't just hear what's being taught sorry don't just hear what's being taught take it in act on it buy the Vaseline if you need to Follow through and look at yourself. See the errors in your own self, in your own action, and change them before you call it out in others. My mom always says that when you point your finger at one person, you have three more pointing back at yourself. You are not without fault. When... <laughs> When I started studying James a few weeks ago to prepare for today, I started by asking God to open my eyes to what I'd never seen in this book before. Mm -hmm. And uh, I kept telling everybody that James has no chill. It was like every single section called out a part of my heart that I kept tucked in and folded up neatly just to pull it out and examine it and deal with it when I was alone, or s in other cases, ignore it completely. I actually thought that I was doing pretty good. In fact, I kind of prided myself on how far I'd come in controlling my flesh 
and in being spirit-led. But God literally started opening the doors of my heart and just picked me apart one dirty rag at a time. I was prompted to confess hurts that no one knew about. I was prompted to confess offenses that no one knew about in humility, meaning I accepted that it was my fault and my problem. I didn't need anybody to apologize. I needed to confess what I was hiding in my heart. God brought me to a place of understanding that it's my problem. Nobody else's. God moved me to dismantle what I thought was good enough so he could start building his best. And he completely shattered my notion of humility and prompted me to walk out things that I normally find very uncomfortable. All just to teach me that I can do better. And I need to rely on him and his leading. When I say uncomfortable, I don't just show up places. I go to work and I go home because I like my four walls. And inside my four walls, I don't have to wear pants. <laughs> That's a joke. <laughs> See, Ben got it because he's like, me either. <laughs> <laughs> inside my four walls, I, I don't I don't have to be Pastor Cindy. And I don't mean that as a negative thing because this is something that God called me to. This is something that moves me amazingly. But I can just be me. I can just be mom. And it was not easy. It actually caused a lot of people, including fellow Christians, to question me and even suggest that I had ulterior motives or wonder what I was getting at. But I held firm that this is between me and God, and he was doing something in me because I opened his word and said, all right, show me what's up, and he went, game on. I decided to listen and actually follow through, and I decided that when I opened James to study, I was going to let God show me this book in a way that I had never seen it before because I will not be that person. I will not be that pastor, and I will not be that teacher that tells you what to do, and meanwhile, I'm out there doing my own thing, ignoring God. I refuse to be that person. And isn't that just like God to take one yes and then give you the opportunity to put everything into practice? James 1.26, if those who claim devotion to God don't control what they say, they mislead themselves. Their devotion is worthless. True devotion, the kind that is pure and faultless before God the Father, is this. To care for orphans and widows in their difficulties and keep the world from contaminating us. James speaks so casually on anger because he's acknowledging a universal truth. You're going to get mad. It happens. We will all find ourselves offended by something or someone at some point in our lives. And when this happens, our anger is triggered. The Greek word that James uses is orge. It's very straightforward. It means a feeling of intense emotion. It's sort of like a fire pit. Orge is the fire. And it's great when it's controlled within the boundaries of righteousness. A fire contained serves a purpose and it's safe. Just like righteous anger, it doesn't burn others, it changes things, it brings warmth, it brings light, and it makes really good s'mores. Orge, when controlled by righteous or by godly boundaries, is good. But a boundaryless fire is bad. It causes damage to everything around it, including human life. It burns, it destroys without regard, and that is the contamination. The fuel of the world is greed, anger, selfishness, immorality, impatience, unkindness. It invades that fire pit, and that fire spreads and spreads and spreads. And before you know it, a small thing has become an explosion of anger because we took away the containing boundary of godliness. So how do you put that boundary wall back up? You can say, well, I'm pretty patient. I don't get mad. Liar. Cool, but liar. You totally get mad. I used to think that it took a lot for me to get mad too, but then 
I opened my mouth and opened James, and God was like, oh, look at these little corners where you're just ignoring things. I get annoyed. I get frustrated. I get bothered. I get hurt. Every single one of those are a symptom of unrighteous anger. Even those things that you hide in your heart, those silent hurts that you think nobody knows about, that's flesh. That's also human. See, it's, it's not a matter of when you get, or if you get angry. It's when. <coughs> Reflect. Is this the selfish, is this anger selfish, or is this something that God, too, would be angry with? Truth be told, most of the time the answer is no. If we're honest, we can acknowledge that the majority of our anger is selfish. We wanted something and we didn't get it. Just clean your room. I want to be included. That's not how you should do this. I don't like this. I don't like them. I prefer it done like this. Didn't they see me? Why am I not appreciated? Why would they say that? Why would you do that? Don't color on the walls. I felt this. I want that. The list can go on and on and on. And don't forget, you guys, this is something God is dealing with me about too. I've had every opportunity to walk in the flesh on those things and be like, hmm, I'm going to say some things. It's okay to get more information before you express your anger. God is, <laughs> God is really dealing with this, with me on this one. Steve annoys me. I know. <laughs> it's hard to believe, you guys. But instead of getting mad, I've had to make that conscious effort to breathe, reflect, and get more information, and even communicate my perspective calmly <laughs> and rationally. <laughs> what is this? Let me be very clear, though. I am always right. I'm just kidding. It was actually only a couple of weeks ago that we were at odds, and neither one of us were wrong, but we weren't exactly right either. We simply needed to communicate and acknowledge their perspective. But whatever your situation is, it's important to get to the heart of the anger. Number one, what was the situation? Number two, how did you react? Number three, what did you desire? Number four, did you respond with righteous or unrighteous anger? What were the consequences? Number five, is my anger directed towards building up or towards destruction? And number six, have I prayed for God's heart in it or did I just try to bend his heart to my will? That one is, I'm a bender. When we're going through a trial, it's because God is telling us that there's something that we lack. Is it patience? Maybe it's the awareness of others. Maybe it's surrender. Trust? Are we leaning on our pride or our need for control? Maybe we don't have compassion. Or maybe it's just good old-fashioned humility we really need. See, when God is trying to talk to us in our trials, we can be so quick to speak and not listen to him or anyone else. God doesn't just want you to put off anger. He wants you to replace it with a putting on of the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. There's no law against any of those, and they don't hurt anybody. Worship team, if you'll come up. It's not enough to just stop being angry. You have to get to the root of the sin. Repent. Replace it with humility and the fruit of the Spirit and ask for forgiveness. You can apologize and not change the anger or change the behavior. That's, that's just asking for forgiveness. But to apologize and change is repentance. You're not always right. You're not never the problem. 
And if you don't see the Bible as a mirror, you need to read it again. You have to practice that habit of cultivating the process of examining your heart. It has to be a daily practice of letting go of self and cleaning out the junk so that the enemy has nothing to grab onto. You put on that new mind, that renewing of your mind. That way your knee-jerk reaction to something doesn't become anger or offense. Instead, it becomes looking at the situation with God's heart. And fun fact, science actually backs this up. Science actually says that the more you practice processing your emotions and thoughts, the more you can have a natural, healthy output of regulated emotions. It's an intentional choice to control your mind and put on the renewed mind of God. It's not what happens to you, church. It's how you respond to it that shows Christ's love. Just like James says we should be quick to listen and slow to speak and slow to get angry because when we choose to hear and understand and allow God to lead us, things change. Anger is not producing the righteousness that God wants in you. Offense is not producing the righteousness that God wants in you. Irritation is not producing the righteousness God wants. Control. You are not in control. And if you think you are, I, I will talk to you later. God is the only one in control. You have to get out of the way. Let the word of God plant deep roots in your heart. Let God work on you and change you into the person he calls you to be. Because the world will know us by our love. Our anger is what's going to make the atheists know that we're wrong. Do you want to impact them? Get rid of it. Do you want to love them? Pull it out. Put on the fruit of the Spirit. God, I thank you so much for this time. I thank you for this word. Thank you for the change that you're doing in me, God. And I, I truly believe, Lord, that you, you called this message out. You brought this message because it's not just me you need to deal with. But I thank you for the opportunity to be, to be the voice for it. As it is, we go forth from this place, Lord, that you would remind us that you have good things for us. Remind us of the moments where you are working all things together because we love you. And help us take ourself out of it. Uh, we have people available to pray with you if you need to pray, and the worship team has a final song. If you're done, there are goodies next door. We invite you for a time of fellowship. Have a great week.